is I want to propose and to try to provide some support for a kind of a conjecture about the mind-body problem that um, I'm, in, I'm inclined myself to accept. Okay. Now, today, I can't really do very much by way of um, supporting it. I can't. Uh, I mean, I, and that's not just today. I mean, it would be quite hard for me to support it even if I had masses of time and you know, could talk at great length. Um, but what I want to do is to try to specify this conjecture and fill it out a bit and try to in some ways sell it, sell it to you. Okay. Um, and this conjecture has two sides. This conjecture, it has a two sides. Okay. The first side is that despite the fact that the mind-body problem has been a central focus of philosophical discussion ever since the end of the Second World War, continuously since then. It has been the focus of intense philosophical discussion. It's the, and, and in a sense, the focus by philosophers on this problem has been as great as it has been on any problem over that period, seems to me. Um, no, no philosophical problem has attracted more attention. However, despite, despite having had this continuous attention, um, my conjecture is that philosophers have actually um, given us no reasons for preferring one view about the mind-body problem to the alternative view. I'll try and... I'm basically... I'm assuming that the fundamental choice in the philosophy of mind about the mind-body problem is between materialism and its denial. And so what I'm saying is that philosophers have given no reasons for favoring materialism, nor any reasons for denying materialism. Basically, they haven't made any progress with the problem. Okay, so that, that is my no progress report. That's the idea. Um, and that's my first conjecture. And the second conjecture is, as in a sense, a sort of explanation for that. Okay, and, and, and that is that the, 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 the mind-body problem is really a problem about the real nature of what might be called mental occurrences, about the real nature of mental occurrences. And it is, therefore, a problem that... In, a, in, in a, a significant sense, it's kind of empirical. It, the answer to it is going to be determined really by empirical and scientific exploration of the world as it is, and not by philosophers devising arguments for favoring one view over another. Okay, so it's the kind of, the kind of problem it is, it is a real problem about the nature of what goes on in the world, uh, and therefore, it's not surprising that philosophy hasn't made any progress with this problem because philosophers have very limited access to, the, to reality. Okay, <laughs> putting it that way. Um, now, the, the, first, the first part of this conjecture, the first bit of the conjecture, has itself got two parts, which... I'll just spell out, although I have done already, and that is that there have been no good philosophical reasons for denying that materialism is true, and there are no good philosophical reasons for affirming that materialism is true. Those are the two sides of that conjecture. Okay. Now, as I see it, um, the conjecture that there are no good reasons for denying materialism is somewhat easier to motivate or support than the, the claim that there are no good reasons in favor of materialism. Okay, And uh, I'm inclined to say that for the following reason. Um, arguments against materialism take the following form, putting it very schematically. They will go, 
if materialism is true, then C follows. Okay. C is just standing for some thing that can be alleged to be an implication of materialism. Okay. And then the second part of this argument will be uh, we can show not C, or C is not true. And then you infer materialism is false. Okay, so the, the, stru the basic structure of these arguments is very, very simple. Um, and secondly, in kind of a lot of discussions of the problem, the C is filled out as a modal claim, a claim about possibility or necessity. Okay, there's been a tendency to try to get philosophers to argue against materialism because it has certain what might be called modal implications. And then the philosopher says, well, these modal implications are mistaken, so materialism is false. And what I want to kind of suggest to you is that the modal implications of materialism aren't modal implications which philosophers have any real reason to deny. Philosophers have no good reasons to deny modal implications of the kind you get out of materialism. Okay. Um, so there's a kind of a unity as to what's going on there which allows one to build up a case of skepticism about philosophical arguments because they tend to share a certain shape and content. Okay. But when you're thinking about arguments for materialism, arguments for materialism can take any, any form. Right? They can just be, you're just looking for a structure of premises which imply that materialism is true. Okay? And there's no laying out in advance what structure or nature those types of arguments have to exhibit. Okay. Um, but so, so trying to justify the idea that there are no good philosophical arguments in favor of materialism is, is more difficult because you're, you're grappling with a range of different possible arguments. Okay. But there are, there, are sort of, there are two thoughts I want to give you right at the beginning. I don't expect you to believe them, but these are what I hope will kind of look a bit more plausible by the end. Um, <clears throat> one is this strong sense you have to retain that the mind-body problem is a problem about the real nature of certain processes in the world. So it's, a, it's an issue about what actually they amount to or consist in or are. Okay. So since it's a real problem, um, it is sort of hard to see how philosophers are really in a position either to show what the real nature isn't or what the real nature is. Um, um, and as far as arguments in favor are concerned, when philosophers put forward arguments, what I'm going to suggest is roughly that either these arguments start from premises which are a bit too far away from materialism to get you there. So the premises in those kinds of arguments are perfectly reasonable, but they can't really be filled out in a way which will get you to materialism. Or alternatively, there's a style of argument for materialism which really starts too close to materialism to be an argument for materialism. It's, it's basically an argument which will be accepted only by someone who's more or less already a materialist. Okay? Uh, and so that's a kind of a dilemma which I hope, which if you're thinking in terms of, get, gets some of these arguments in focus, I think. Okay. Um, now, I want, to, I want to say a little bit about the mind-body problem and how I conceive of it, and to distinguish it from and say also a little bit about what I call the self-body problem. Okay, these are two problems which are not the same problem, um, but it's helpful to have them both separated and to say a few words about both of them before I try to develop this skepticism about philosophy and the mind-body problem. Okay. Um, 
Oh, I should add this. Um, what I'm saying, or my conjecture, um, if you, there are many, many people who think about the nature of consciousness who wouldn't resist my conjecture at all. I mean, it's a theme in many, many scientific discussions of consciousness that uh, it's a mystery what philosophers are doing dealing with this problem. Uh, so the conjecture, the conjecture would be quite um, attractive to lots of people, namely roughly scientists. Okay, they are naturally skeptical about philosophy, and so they voice the same skepticism as well. The weakness, the weakness of their proposal is that they don't know anything about philosophy. Right, and so they're basically saying, uh, I don't know anything about philosophy, but I'm damn sure that you can't be doing anything worth knowing about this problem. Okay, now that is not a very solid accusation against the discipline. So what I'm trying to do is to argue from within philosophy that that's a reasonable view, taking into account the actual nature of philosophy. Okay, so that's meant to be stronger than, than, the, than the accusations that they make. But I, I, do, I want to say there are people who will be quite happy with what I'm saying. Not necessarily people in this room, who maybe tend to be philosophers, but people who don't qualify as that. Okay. Um, now, the mind-body problem. Let me just say a little bit very quickly about the mind-body problem. Um, basically, the mind-body problem has got three elements that need to be attended to. Um, it, it, it's, it's, the question is, what's the relation between the mind and the body? That's putting it in its kind of express form, right? Um, and so there are two relata, where, which in the way the problem is named, one is picked out by the term mind, and the other is picked out by the term body. Okay. The third element in the problem is to specify a kind of a relation between the relata, which is what we're interested in um, working out whether that relation obtains or not. So you've got to clarify three different things. The mind, what mind stands for, what body stands for, and what the relation is. Okay. Now, the standard conventional way of moving at this point, and I'm not at all critical of that, is just to say uh, we can convey what we mean by mind by just giving examples. And people latch on from examples so that they know that the phenomenon in the world that we're talking about when we use the term mind. Okay. And so one says things like um, having an experience of pain is something which the term mind is picking out. Or having experiences more generally. Those are the kinds of things that we're talking about when we talk about the mind. And we can also mention things like having beliefs or having desires or having intentions. These are all features of the world which fall under the general term mind. And we're, the question is a question about that kind of thing. And one doesn't need to define the term mind or restrict it in any particularly articulate way. One just takes these examples as fixing the focus of the problem. That's okay. Similarly, on the body side, okay, when people talk about the body, um, that's really shorthand for what one might call um, physical features in the world, physical things in the world. And what are they as well? Examples would be Neurons firing, bodies moving, um, you know, uh, things falling over, things having a certain weight, etc., etc. The physical properties of the things that, that are just there. Now, so someone just says, "Well, you can grasp what that is. You know what that is," uh, and and so we know the kinds of relata that we're dealing with here. Okay. Um, Now, there are, there are people who think that's not satisfactory, okay, who look, look for kind of more by way of specification of what the problem is about. But for myself, I don't find uh, there is something unsatisfactory about that. It seems to me giving examples and, as it were, focusing on what one naturally takes to be other cases like those seems a perfectly satisfactory way to proceed. Okay, now, uh, what about the relation, though? What's the relation? Well, the thing I want to stress, and I hope, I hope this articulates something for you, 
is that when people are asking for the relation between these mental phenomenon and these physical phenomenon, um, what is obvious is that physical phenomena are incredibly extensive in the world. Okay, physical things are everywhere. Okay, mental things are not everywhere. Mental things are fairly restricted in their presence in the world, as far as we know. Okay, uh, and so what's being asked really is what is the nature of the presence of mental things when it is present? Uh, in particular, what's the real relation between the physical things that are going on in the world and the presence of these mental things? Okay, so it's very much a question about the real nature of mental occurrences and mental presences, um, given that, uh, and the, uh, as to what their relation is to these physical things that, that are so manifestly present in, in the world. Okay, and I think it seems to me that the fundamental option when you're thinking about these two relata. The fundamental option is a choice between saying something like, well, the mental things that are present are present solely in virtue of the particular physical things that are going to be going on there and then. Or as you might put it, the mental things that are present are nothing really over and above the physical things that are there going on. Okay? Or, the men this is a very resonant term, and people like it or dislike it, but it seems okay to me. Um, the mental things can be reduced to, or just come down to, the physical things that are there. Okay. Um, now that is enough, I think, to, to kind of fix um, uh, enough for us to be going on with as to what kind of relation we're interested in. Um, we can employ the terminology of nothing over above, the terminology of reduction. Another terminology which I find very helpful is the terminology of constitution. So that one, the materialist view would be saying, well, when mental features are present, their presence is exhaustively constituted by the presence of physical features. Right, that's a, that's a kind of a, a way of putting what the materialist option is. Uh, and the non-materialist option is basically to say, well, look, that is not the nature of what we've got. That is not the nature of mental features as they are present in the world. Okay. So you have the fundamental choice you have to make is between those two lines. Those two lines. Um, now, as far as the relation is concerned, um, in, if you're familiar with kind of current discussions of the mind-body problem, um, two kind of ways of specifying the relation have been very popular. One is to employ the notion of supervenience, or the term terminology of supervenience, so that materialism is taken to mean, to be uh, uh, explained as the mental supervenes on the physical. Okay, and roughly, supervenience is the idea that a certain kind of type of feature, A, supervenes on a type of feature B, just in case if you fix the B pre features, you thereby fix the A features. So necessarily, once the B features are fixed, the A features are fixed. That's the notion of supervenience. Okay. So that's an attempt to articulate the relation in modal terms. Right. Um, I, don't, I don't want to particularly endorse that, but it's going to, there's going to be some notion of modality which I want to bring in in the argument. Okay. Another relation which has always been popular in post-war philosophy is the relation of identity. So people would say, well actually the materialist view is that these mental occurrences are identical to certain physical occurrences. There's a relation of identity between them. That's the sense in which they just come down to be the same thing. They are the same thing because there's an identity relation. Um, Right, so what I'm going to say then, this is as clear, this is as, clear as it's going to get today, um, is there is a, we have a sense of a kind of relation which this terminology is trying to express and capture in which one feature of the world depends on or comes down to another feature of the world. Okay. Uh, and the notion of reduction, the term of talk about reduction seems to be perfectly appropriate. I'm not going to try and say more about it 
or fix it more definitely than that. But then it gives us enough to treat, take the mind-body problem as a problem. Okay, that's the, that is the mind-body problem as I'm taking it. Okay. Um, now, I want to, now I want to just contrast that problem with what I'm calling the self-body problem before coming back to the mind-body problem and trying to sell you the idea that philosophers haven't given us any grounds for favoring one view over another. Okay. And this is the self-body problem. Now, the self-body problem is a long-standing problem in philosophy. And here, the relata of the problem are, if I'm talking about myself, I, what's the relation between I and the body here? Okay, that's why it's called the self-body problem. It's a question about relations between selves and bodies. Okay. Uh, and the fundamental relation about which this question, around which this question turns, is the relation of identity. So people say, am I identical with my body, or am I not identical with my body? Okay. Uh, and that's what I'm thinking of, for the purposes of today anyway, as the self-body problem. Okay. Now, it, it's kind of clear that the self-body problem isn't the same problem as the mind-body problem. The mind-body problem is really a problem about the, the, the ontological nature of certain phenomenon that we find in the world, whereas the self-body problem is really a problem about relations between objects that we find in the world, namely ourselves and our bodies. Okay? So there's a different focus and content to the problem, although it's an interesting question how they are related. Now, the, so far so good. Now, the reason I want to talk for five minutes about the self-body problem is that it gives us kind of, the way it was being discussed gives a sort of template for the way the mind-body problem has recently been discussed. Okay. And, and here I want to just go back to Descartes, because Descartes, Descartes' problem was the self-body problem. That's what he discusses repeatedly in the, in the meditations and elsewhere. He was obsessed with the relation between himself and his body. And of course his view was that he was distinct from his body, which he thought he could show. Now that's stronger than being not identical to your body. Being distinct from your body is a pretty big deal. Um, but um, at the moment I'm just going to take his arguments to be arguments to show you are not identical with your body. Okay. How did Descartes argue this? Well, what Descartes did was basically to use modal type arguments. Right. He, he, he fundamentally thought that you cannot be identical with your body because you have modal properties which your body doesn't have. In other words, the non-identity comes out when you look at modality. Okay. Here's an example. Descartes thought um, <clears throat> your body is essentially extended. That is, your body is necessarily something which occupies space and has physical parts. Okay? That doesn't look wrong. That looks kind of plausible. Uh, but then he said, but I am not a thing which is essentially extended. I don't have that essence. Okay, I, That's not an essence that I have. That's not a modal property that I possess. And since he thought he possessed, he didn't possess that modal property, but his body did, then the non-identity came out. Now, the problem with that argument, and it's going to be the kind of problem I want to discern in other arguments, is it's kind of a valid argument, but how does Descartes know that he was not essentially extended? Right? How did Descartes know that? And all Descartes does is to do something like this. Well, when I sort of think about myself and what could have happened to me and how I might be, I just don't discern any reason for saying I'm essentially extended. Right? That's what he says. But the reply to that, which was pointed out by his contemporaries, who kind of blew his entire philosophy out of the water, uh, immediately it was published, was that doesn't mean you are not essentially extended. It simply means 
by thinking about the matter, you haven't discovered whether you are or not, right? Just by thinking about the matter, you haven't discovered whether you're essentially extended or not. That isn't a ground for saying you're not essentially extended. And they had ready to hand kind of examples where there were necessities which no one for a long, long time could ever discern, right? And so the famous example was Pythagoras' theorem. Okay, before Pythagoras, no one knew the necessary features of, an, of a right-angled triangle. No one could discern what they were. Finally, Pythagoras managed to work it out. But that you are not in a position to affirm a certain modal property in and of itself doesn't mean that you lack it. It just means you haven't worked out whether it's present or not. And he, another kind of example that Descartes used, this time in the discourse on method, and this is kind of a, this is kind of a funny argument, it seems to me, is he argued like this. He said, um, I can solve any problem that comes up. Right, so that's a kind of a modal property he was ascribing to himself. And then he said, but bodies cannot solve absolutely any problem that comes up. Therefore, I'm not identical with my body because I have a modal feature which my body lacks. Okay. Um, now, when you think about that argument, both modal premises are kind of dubious. Why should anyone say? Why, how is Descartes entitled to say he could solve absolutely any problem that came up? Well, he's got no reason for saying that. Absolutely no reason. He might have solved a lot of problems, but he's certainly got no reason for thinking that he has this property of being able to solve any problem. Why did Descartes think his body couldn't solve any problem that came up? Well, the answer, that, the answer is he looked at kind of physical objects that he was familiar with in, in his environment and noticed that they weren't pretty good at solving problems, right? You know, so he thought, well, there are kind of machines which can do a little bit, like clocks. <laughs> you know, maybe a clock is working out the time. It can work out that kind of problem. But it can't work out much else. Okay. Now, very good. That argument is completely powerless because um, it only shows what clocks can do. And it doesn't show anything about what Descartes can do, because Descartes was made of different material to a clock. Okay. And in fact, if Descartes really did think that he could solve absolutely any problem that there was, uh, what he should have concluded was, well, in that case, there's some pretty amazing matter in the world. Right? You know. And there is, namely the central nervous system. I mean, that's pretty damn good. Um, but this is a kind of a modal argument where the modal premises look plausible to a philosopher, but really when you stand back from them, they're not. Okay. So I'm hoping you're getting from this something like a skepticism about the way philosophers handle modality. Okay. That's what I'm trying to, in a sense, sell you. Um, now, I want to, now I want to kind of move on to materialism. So... Um, Philosophers are not good at modality. Now, I, I do not have, I'm not trying to give you, because I do not have, a kind of epistemological theory about how we make modal judgments. Okay, that's not something I have my hands on at all. I am prepared to allow that we are able to make modal judgments and that we can have modal knowledge. And I haven't got an argument to try and show that we can't have modal knowledge, and I don't have a picture of how we get modal knowledge. Right. What, what I'm trying to sell is there are some modal claims which don't look the kind of claim that we can make. Right. That's what I'm kind of trying to sell. And so now I'm going to turn to the kind of modal arguments that philosophers have used recently to attack materialism. Okay. That's what I want to look at. Um, and I'm going to take my examples from Chalmers and his book, The Conscious Mind, a book which has had an enormous effect and which is very, very impressive. Okay. Um, I'm not going to look in detail at Chalmers' text because it's extremely complicated. That's one of the problems, actually, about philosophers, um, that they love complexity and 
the crucial point gets lost, right? The crucial point gets lost in the massive complexity that is piled on to a central and very simple kind of argument, okay? Um, how does Chalmers, how does Chalmers, what are the reasons does Chalmers give for thinking that materialism isn't right, okay? Well, his argument, he has the following kind of argument, very famous argument, which goes, if materialism is true, and so the very nature of mental occurrences is um, given by the physical presence of what's there, okay, then it wouldn't be possible for there to be zombies, right? Zombies would be impossible. Now, what's a zombie? Well, a zombie is meant to be a creature that is, and here we can put it this way, physically the same as you are now, right? Physically the same as you are now, but it's a zombie in that it doesn't have, it's not having any experiences, right? So what I'm assuming is that everyone I'm addressing is having experiences, okay? Um, the materialist thinks that the presence of these experiences consists in or comes down to or can be reduced to the physical goings on that are happening to you, or some of them, some specific physical happenings. Okay. Um, now, if he's right about that, it does look correct to say, well, wherever you get the same physical happenings, they will amount to the same thing because the thing is just what those physical happenings are. Okay. So, in other words, it does look plausible to say that if materialism is true, then there couldn't be zombies. There could not be zombies. Um, well, what does, what does, uh, what, how does the argument go? Well, the argument goes, but there could be zombies. Zombies are perfectly possible. There's a possibility that there are zombies. And then you get the falsity of materialism following from these two premises. Okay. Well, I seem to think that the first premise in this type of argument is plausible. Okay. I, I mean, I'm not shown that it's true, but I think that if materialism does imply the impossibility of zombies, they don't look consistent to me. Okay. The question I want to raise is, uh, why, are we, why should we be sure that zombies are possible? Why should we be sure that zombies are possible? Okay. Well, how does this argument go? Or uh, if people are trying to run it, how does it, how does it run? Um, well, really, as a first shot, the way the argument runs is, I can imagine zombies. I can imagine zombies. That means that zombies are conceivable, and that means that zombies are possible. So materialism is false. Okay. Uh, now, what's the counter to that? What's the counter to that? Well, one counter to that is, um, fundamentally, that argument is making a transition from imaginability to possibility. That's the crucial transition. I can imagine zombies, therefore they are possible, and your theory rules them out, therefore your theory is wrong. Okay. But one would have thought that imaginability doesn't reveal what's really possible. Why should one suppose that because something is imaginable, it mounts to a proof or a ground for thinking it's really possible? Okay. Um, and, and let me just add, let me just build, add to that a bit, you see. Um, fundamentally, when you imagine a zombie, what are you doing? These people who think, you know, who, who want to imagine zombies, what do you do? Well, basically what you do is this. You say, I can imagine a body exactly like mine. Now I'm doing that. Right. But since you don't know what your body's like, except in the most superficial characteristics, to imagine a body like yours is just to say to yourself, oh, I'm imagining a body exactly like mine. Right. You're not doing more than that. Okay. And then... What is it to imagine that this thing is a zombie? Well, you just say, 
uh, oh yeah, I'm imagining that there are no experiences going on in it. How do you do that? Well, you just say, and there are no experiences going on in it. <laughs> right? That is what someone who imagines a zombie is doing. And I think that's perfectly okay. You are imagining a zombie. That's what you need to do to imagine a zombie. But if that is what imagining a zombie is, it looks remarkably odd to suggest it's telling you something about the real nature of mentality. It's too easy to reveal anything about reality. I mean, because the person, the person on the other side is wanting to say, well, the real nature of what's going on is that it's physical. And you say, well, I can do this, so you're wrong. But what you're doing is so slight and so easy, it cannot really be a guide to the real nature of what's going on. Okay, so that's the first doubt about zombie arguments. Okay. Um, and and it, it's, a, it's an attempt to spell out how bringing an argument of a modal kind where the support for the modal claim is done that way cannot really have any bearing on a real, a question about the real nature of anything, right? It can't have a bearing on a question about the real nature of anything. Um, and I'm just going to link that up with, um, this will be very brief, I, know, I don't know whether it would make a lot of sense, but um, we're in a territory, although Chalmers wants to distance himself a little bit from this territory, we're in a territory which um, was clarified in a tremendous way by Kripke, by the American philosopher Saul Kripke. Okay, because Kripke was the first person um, who really uh, made it look very plausible that identities entail necessities. You know, so his, uh, one of his papers is Identity and Necessity. And his, his famous monograph, Naming and Necessity, is an attempt to link names to necessity as well. All right. And Kripke, Kripke made a very strong case for thinking that if there are identities, then there are necessities. Okay. That's the background here. Um, now, so far, so good. The arguments for thinking that identities give you necessities um, is very intuitively plausible. Um, now, what then struck Kripke as a bit worrying, so I shall say, is um, what was he going to say about the, the identities that science came up with, such as um, water is H2O or heat is molecular motion. Because these kinds of identities are identities which entail necessities on Kripke's view. I, so if heat is molecular motion, necessarily you have heat. I mean, you, can, you can't have heat without molecular motion. And if you have the right kind of molecular motion, you must have heat, because that's what it is. All right. Now, here Kripke's system looks as if it's handing an argument to revisionary physicists or revisionary chemists. Okay, because this is a new physical chemical argument which is going to go, look, you scientists say heat is molecular motion. That entails that heat has to be molecular motion. But I can imagine that heat isn't molecular motion, so you're wrong. Right. That's like the argument I've just used against materialism. Now, clearly, Kripke did not want his system to support such an argument. Otherwise, it would be laughed out of court. And so what he has to do is to kind of disarm the argument for modality in this case. That was his strategy. Um, now, what was his strategy? Well, his strategy very, very, very crudely came down to saying, uh, you might think you're imagining heat without molecular motion, but that's not actually what you're doing. You're not doing that. You're doing something slightly different. You're imagining the effects of heat without molecular motion. Now, that makes perfect sense. That's his idea. Okay. And then Kripke said, ah, so if you can re-describe what's being imagined in a certain way, then 
the argument on, based on necessities fails, but you can't use that redescription in the mind case, right? So the mind argument still goes through, and Kripke is an anti-materialist, right? He uses this argument against materialism. The question, the question I just want to throw at you is, um, or two questions. One is, actually, to say that when you think you're imagining heat without molecular motion, that's not what you're actually doing. That's a remarkably odd proposal. That's a very odd proposal. You know, because you say, well, <laughs> I mean, when you imagine heat without molecular motion, that's, that's not very complicated. You know, I just say, imagine heat without molecular motion. How do you do that? Well, it's exactly like the mind case. You just think, okay, I'm imagining there's some heat. And yeah, yeah, I'm imagining there's no molecular motion. Uh, there we are. I've done it. And it's, it's kind of very implausible to say, oh, that's really not what you're doing. That's really not what you're doing. Um, we kind of think that is what you're doing, but we, the obvious thing to say is it doesn't get you anywhere. It can't get you anywhere. Uh, and so the reason I want to suggest this, there is no good justification for thinking that philosophers are in a position to tell you the nature of mental states, right, and use these little arguments there, if they're not in a position to do it in connection with heat. Why should that be? Why should philosophers have more insight into the nature of mental states than they have into the nature of heat? And actually, I think there's no obvious answer to that question. You know, the, only, the only reason why they think they can do it is that, that's, that they've always done it, right? <laughs> they've always been making pronouncements about the mind, but they've never been quite so stupid to make many pronouncements about heat, at least once we departed from ancient philosophy, right? But in reality, they're all on a level. There's no real difference between pronouncing about the nature of heat and pronouncing about the nature of experience or sensation. They're all real questions about what's going on and why do philosophers have any insight into, into one rather than the other. Okay, so now, um, that isn't all that should be said, but I'm, I'm just trying to get you to feel that these arguments based on modality are ones you should be suspicious of. Ones you should be suspicious of, actually. Um, now, that's, that's what I want to say about the, um, well, for the moment, anyway, about the anti-materialist arguments. Roughly, m roughly, my view is anti-materialist arguments on the whole rely on modal claims which the philosophers who propose them are in no position to affirm. They should say, well, what's possible for what's possible for experience turns, out, turns on what it is. That's what's possible for experience is a matter of what experience turns out to be. And we are not in a position to say what's possible for experience prior to that question being solved. Ditto, that's what you should say about heat. You know, if it's possible that there's heat without molecular motion, then heat isn't molecular motion. But if it's not possible, then heat can be molecular motion. And until you've worked out what heat is, you're not in a position to say which is possible, right? Uh, and it's some prejudice that makes philosophers think they can make these assertions about minds, but not about heat. It's all the same. Okay, now I want to talk about the arguments for materialism, right? Um, and I'm going to be, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of cutting a lot of corners here, because I'm just trying to plant seeds um, of skepticism. Uh, and so it's going to be fairly bold and rather high level. Okay. Um, and what I've selected are two arguments which I'm going to talk about fairly rapidly for materialism. One argument is the argument that Smart, JJC Smart, proposed in his very famous paper at the end of the 1950s called Sensations and Brain Processes. Okay. It was a seminal paper, along with various others that were being published at the time, because it fundamentally altered the way people thought about what might be called the mind-body problem. Okay. Because up until that period, 
philosophers had thought, if we just sort out our concepts, the mind-body problem kind of goes away. That was the attitude of Ryle, who thought, well, if we can just kind of do some sort of analysis of our mental concepts, that's it. That was the attitude of Strawson, who thought he could do some certain kind of conceptual arguments showing that Cartesian dualism was incoherent. Okay. And Wittgenstein doesn't fit in quite as well with that, but you didn't have to do any work, really, to solve the mind-body problem as far as Wittgenstein is concerned. Okay. Um, but once Smart and the people around him came on the scene, that attitude changed. Because what Smart was saying was actually the mind-body problem is a problem about the real nature of conscious occurrences, fundamentally. It's a problem about the real nature of conscious experiences, uh, and we want to know what they are. Okay, and no amount of conceptual investigation is going to tell you what they really are. Okay, so that idea was the idea that Smart and people around him at the time was trying to put forward, and it seems to me that they did that, they, they kind of shifted the way the problem was viewed very convincingly um, from the immediate period beforehand. Okay, that's, so that's the conception of the problem which I'm operating with, and we owe that to the materialists at that period. Okay, Smart being um, one of them, but a very, a very um, impressive one. Okay. So having, having kind of tried to get that picture of the problem, Smart then argues for materialism, okay, in a certain kind of argument. And Smart's argument basically appeals to Occam's razor. This is how Smart did it. He says, um, it's a good principle in thinking about the nature of things to prefer simpler theories to complex theories, and to prefer theories which don't postulate entities beyond necessity. Okay? Um, that's, that's, that's Occam's razor. And everyone would say, good old Occam, right? We, we like that. That looks okay. Um, now, the principle, the principle is really a cateris paribus principle. The principle says, other things being equal, go for the simpler theory, right? But the other things being equal means, unless there's some very, then there's a reason for going for the more complex theory, right? That's what he's saying. Um, now, if, if you've got Occam's razor, um, how is that going to have, have a bearing on the mind-body problem? Well, Smart had two thoughts. One is that Looked at in a very general way, materialism is simpler than its denial. Okay, the reason is that we've got to allow that there's material happenings and physical happenings throughout the world. They're there anyway. If you can, if you can kind of identify or reduce mental things to those features or those kinds of features, then that's a simpler picture of the world than if you have a picture of the world in which there's all these physical things going on, as well as certain other things, namely to do with mentality. Okay, so it is true that the materialist picture can qualify as a simpler picture than the non-materialist picture. And we've got this cateris paribus principle from Occam that other things being equal, you prefer simpler views to complex views. Okay, so far so good. What did, what did Smart then do? Well, Smart said, I'm going to show you that other things are equal, right? There are other things are equal, and therefore the materialist view is the one we should support. Okay. Now there are two problems with the way Smart himself actually did it, which are obvious. Um, to show that other things are equal, what Smart did was to select the objections to materialism and to respond to them, to show there are no objections to materialism. Okay. And there are two obvious problems with the way he does that. One is he doesn't answer all the problems, right? So he hasn't, even if he's answered all the problems he's taken, he hasn't shown that everything is equal, okay? But secondly, it's kind of obvious when you look at what he says that he hasn't satisfactorily answered some of these problems anyway, 
Right. So that claim that other things are equal, therefore there are no, I mean, there are no objections to materialism. That premise in his argument isn't supported by smart properly. So actually, as developed by smart, um, there is no support for materialism in this argument. Um, but there's a kind of a problem about this type of argument, because if, you, if you're going to focus on this type of argument, people will say, OK, look, it may be true that Smart's version of it doesn't show that other things are equal. Therefore, simplicity carries you to materialism. But actually, uh, if we sit around thinking about this problem, looking for problems with materialism and don't find any, that's going to get the, the, a reasonable basis for saying other things are equal. Okay. Now, what worries me there is, why do philosophers sitting thinking about materialism suppose that the kinds of difficulties that are going to be occurring to them are the only difficulties that there are in the way of materialism. Why do they think that? Okay, because basically when a philosopher is thinking about materialism, he might be able to think about certain kind of implications and certain possibilities that follow, etc., etc., And he might be able to um, deal with those, but why suppose that is the only kind of problem that might, there might be, the only issue that needs to be taken care of before you can say, oh, well, everything's equal. Then. Okay. And, and yet again, what I want to suggest is that the idea that philosophers can show that other things are equal and therefore the simplicity principle works um, reflects the idea that philosophers have that somehow this is a problem that they are experts on and that they know how to deal with and grapple with. When in fact, there's no reason for them to suppose that. Okay, the real difficulties might come in, well, constructing a theory of pain, which is a physical theory of pain, right? Or constructing a theory of perception, which is a physical theory of perception, and so on. So, um, basically, I'm suggesting that Smart's type of argument um, doesn't get you anywhere in the form that Smart proposes it, and um, it's not going to be up to philosophers to show that other things are equal because they can't show that. So that kind of argument is too far away from where you want to get to to really take you there. That's the idea. Okay. Um, but now, now I kind of want to, and this is going to be the, the final bit, the coda, look at what I think is the most popular argument that people have for materialism these days. It's an argument which I used to think was really good. I did, I did think it was very, very good. Um, and I'm going to have to be very brief and a little bit unfair. Okay, but let's, let's have a go. Um, this is the argument which was pioneered by Christopher Peacock and which has been very well expressed and developed by David Papineau, and it's sometimes called the overdetermination argument. Okay. Now, I haven't got a board, so I can't write it down, but I, it's, it's kind of simple. It's fairly simple. Okay. Um, the argument as it's set out, and I'm basically I'm relying on the version of the argument in Papineau's book, Thinking About Consciousness, Chapter 1, which is a very good uh, presentation of the argument. Okay. Uh, and that Papin Papineau kind of approaches the problem in this sort of way. He wants to say conscious mental occurrences, let's call them experiences, have physical effects. Okay. His example of that is, um, say, an experience of thirst, an experience of thirst might cause you to walk towards the fridge to get a bottle of lager. Okay. And walking towards the fridge is a physical thing, and here's a conscious experience having produced it. So conscious ex mental experiences produce physical effects. Okay, that looks quite plausible. Then the second premise, which he labels the completeness of physics. Okay, that makes it look very impressive. 
the completeness of physics. And this says all physical effects are fully caused by purely physical prior histories or prior physical causes. All physical effects are fully caused by prior physical causes. Okay. <coughs> What's the picture there? Well, the picture there is one that is kind of quite plausible, and, and that is, well, when you think about the physical world, there are physical causal chains, and any kind of physical change in the world is going to have as its, re as its cause a physical causal chain generating it and just going back preceded by more physical causes and so on. Uh, that's the kind of picture called the completeness of physics. Okay, and then the third premise is this, and this is where overdetermination comes in. Okay, um, and what, what, what the idea is, and Papineau says, the physical effects of conscious mental occurrences aren't always overdetermined by distinct causes. Aren't always overdetermined by distinct causes. Roughly, overdetermination is meant to be. A result is overdetermined if it's produced in such a way that um, it would have been produced by only part of what was going on or another part of what was going on. So it's kind of occurrence was overdetermined by what led up to it. That's the crude idea. Okay. And so that's the argument. So conscious experiences have physical effects. Every physical effect has a purely physical cause. And not all the physical effects of conscious experiences are overdetermined. So the, the way he's thinking is if this movement had a mental cause, that's one cause. But being a physical movement, it had a physical cause, that's another cause. Um, so if it's got both causes, then it's overdetermined. But the physical consequences of conscious experience aren't always overdetermined. So that cannot be right. That cannot be right. Okay? Um, now, some issues which make me think that this argument doesn't quite get us to where we want it to get us. I'm oh, sorry, where the materialist wants it to get us. Okay? But this is going to be very brief. Okay? Um, one point is about just what I call the logic of the argument in the way it's expressed. Okay? Um, <clears throat> the first premise is conscious experiences have physical effects. Does that mean all conscious experiences have physical effects? Right? Or does it just mean some conscious experiences have physical effects? Well, uh, it's not entirely clear, but if it means all, then that's a very strong claim. You know, you're just saying, uh, I can tell you the nature of mental occurrences because I know that every conscious experience has a physical effect. You think, well, where did that come from? Okay, who's told you that? So actually, it looks more plausibly to be a claim about just some of them. If you feel fairly confident that some of them have physical effects. So automatically, the conclusion of this argument is restricted to some of them. It's not going to be a conclusion about all of them, because we really don't know whether all of them have physical effects or not. Okay. Um, then the, the third premise, which is ruling out overdetermination, has the form, the physical effects of Conscious experiences aren't always overdetermined by distinctive, distinct causes. That's how he puts it. So now you have another weakening of the argument, just in terms of its logic. The first premise is only saying some conscious experiences have physical effects. And then the final says, not all of these are overdetermined. Right? So actually, the actual conclusion of the argument as it stands is just, well, um, something like, not all, so there must, sorry, there must be some conscious experiences, we don't know how many, which at least are such that when they produce their effects, they produce them in such a way that they're not overdetermined. That's all it shows. That's the logic of the argument. Okay. Um, so it's, it's considerably less universal in its implications, given the logic of the argument, than it appears at first sight, I want to say. But secondly, 
There's another logical problem with this argument um, in the form it's here. Okay, and that is it lacks a sort of conclusion. It doesn't really have a conclusion. Okay. Um, because what is the conclusion of this argument? Well, the conclusion of this argument is, is as follows. Some conscious mental experiences must be so related to the physical that their effects, although having complete physical causes, are not overdetermined. Are not overdetermined. Okay, that's all the argument shows. Now, it has to be decided whether that means a materialist account of these things is correct, or whether there's some less than materialist account which would also avoid overdetermination. Okay, it, it kind of leaves you with a problem of trying to work out whether that implies materialism for these cases or not. <coughs> okay, so that's that's another kind of quasi-logical problem with this argument. Um, so what I'm saying is, the conclusion you get out is only going to be a sum conclusion. And it might indeed be only very few, given the logic of the argument. And the conclusion is only must be such as to avoid overdetermination problems. And causation is a quagmire, which is as badly understood as the mind and consciousness, really. And so, you know, we're not really very confident about knowing how that has to be avoided, okay, or what it implies. Um, but Having set this argument out, an argument which Papineau wants to say is definitive, he notices two things. Okay. Well, one is, actually, if you really do think there is something which prevents from having a material nature, if you really think that, and then you kind of are impressed by the rest of the argument, what you will do is to say, well, although I've always thought that mental experiences cause physical effects, maybe I'm wrong about that. That's to say they're the epiphenomenalist option. Okay. <clears throat> and what does Papineau say there? Okay, what, what's the kind of the response to the epiphenomenalist? Well, what Papineau actually does at that point is to say, oh, Smart has really to told us why epiphenomenalism isn't right. If you read what he says, he just moves in the Smartian direction of saying, oh, how strange. <laughs> that, means material, that means the mental is not going to be treated in the same way as lots of other occurrences, and that's going to stand out, and it's going to be different. And that's not very good. We don't like that. It's more complicated. But you think, but hang on. Uh, that, at least if I'm right, that kind of argument isn't very good anyway. Okay, so the idea that you've got a definitive argument for materialism um, is beginning to sort of, I want to suggest, disappear. Okay, uh, and, 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 and another, the other final point I'm going to make about it is this, the so-called completeness of physics premise. That idea, the idea that all physical effects have an absolutely complete physical cause. Um, well, I would say that I would say that, but that that is because basically I I belong to, in some sense, the materialist faith, right? I I kind of worship in that church myself, and that's the kind of picture of the world that we materialists have. But if you're not a materialist, as it were, at the start of all this, you you would be hard pressed to be given any real reason why that has to be so, why you must accept this picture of the world. Okay. Now, that was very brief, and maybe it's not very convincing. But that, that was my attempt to say, this argument relies on premises which are just a bit too close to where he wants to get you for it to be a very satisfactory reason for getting there. Right. So the picture is that the smart type arguments are a little bit too far back, Arguments which rely on very strong claims about the universality and completeness of physical processes are a little bit too close to get you to where you want to get, unless you're already there. Okay. And so uh, 
there's, there's really nothing. Sorry, no, I shouldn't say there's nothing there. What I mean is, um, it's not um, <coughs> definitive and conclusive. It's not definitive and conclusive. Okay, um, so that's the best I can do tonight to sell the idea that philosophers haven't got anywhere. And so we hand the problem over to the people who can do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs>